All right. I want to welcome you who just joined us by Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're watching from. Uh, as I've told the uh, auditorium audience, we'll be starting a new series next week on Bible doctrine. And uh, it'll go on indefinitely. And uh, I hope you'll be here. I hope you'll make yourself a part of it and participate. I think you'll learn much from it. Uh, turn in your Bibles to James' first chapter. And uh, although this is a, a bridge between two countries, I think this is a, a wonderful, a wonderful passage. And uh, I told Bethany today what I'd be teaching tonight, and she said, oh, I wish I could be there. Please make me a CD. So uh, heads up, audio department. Verse 1, chapter 1, book of James. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which were scattered abroad, greedy. Now, brethren, count it all joy. <clears throat> when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. James was here writing to the persecuted and the displaced brethren. Uh, he was challenging them regarding adversity. Uh, by the way, is there anybody here who does not have any adversity? Anybody that doesn't have any trials and tribulations? If you do, raise your hand. <clears throat> well, God sometimes designs trials to prove the genuineness and the sincerity of our faith. We have no right to question God's methods in practicing or producing his desired fruit. He knows what he's doing. He knows that the bitter agonies of sorrow and, and suffering many times are needed to conquer sin. And sometimes we have to go through a humbling experience to get where God wants us to be. Genuine, genuine faith flourishes when it's tested. The real deal, if it's the real deal, it makes you a better person for having gone through it. I will never forget the missionary lady, and I've told you this story several times, uh, who had spent 33 years in Africa, and her husband took the boy, took the five-year-old son out on a preaching safari, and he choked to death on a peanut way out there in the bush, died Mr. Glock buried that boy five days from home. Had to go home and tell his wife and the boy's mother what had happened. Our church was supporting these missionaries at the time. And we got a letter from Mrs. Glock. And she said, God has trusted us with a great sorrow. Isn't that beautiful? God has trusted us with a great sorrow. And then when Sarah came to our home later on, these, these folks had stayed in our home for three or four days during a Bible conference. And she related so much information to me about dealing with heartache and tragedy. And uh, I, I went back to so many things that she had said when she was in our home about the loss of her child and how God doesn't trust everybody with that type of heartbreak. He picks out who, can, who he can trust with it. James, well, the, the theme of the book of James is practical Christianity. Practical Christianity. James practiced what he preached. His, his was a practical salvation, not just a theoretical. A lot of times we, uh, we say we're saved and we say that uh, we're this or we're that. But when it comes down to crunch time and when trouble hits, we fall apart. Uh, James is talking here about 
practical, honest to goodness uh, salvation. Not, not faith and works, but faith that works. Get the difference? Not faith and works, but a faith that works. The character of this writer, James, was in harmony with the control or the content of this book. James's life exemplified his devotion to Jesus and his love for Jesus. The subjects that he addresses in this epistle relate to practical Christian living. Some of the most important lessons to be learned in the Bible can be learned from this little book of James. I encourage you to study the book of James. We have here saving faith versus a profession of faith. In James, in 2.14, James 2.14, this is the key verse, I believe, in this book. 2.14, I'm, I'm in the wrong place here, but I, I'll get it. 2.14 says, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and have not works. Can faith save him? We talk so much, and I preach so much about grace and faith being sufficient for salvation. But And it is. But the faith that saves, the grace that works, produces good works. Produces something that makes, makes it evident that we have Jesus Christ living deep within our hearts. The purpose of adversity, we read in verses 2 through 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Now notice he didn't say if you fall into these temptations. He said when. I used to say to people, if you die, but I, I caught myself with that. It's not if you die, it's when you die. We're all going to die. We're all going to die. So, uh, when you fall, my brethren count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, the word trying means tested, testing of your faith worketh patience. My brethren, patience through tribulation is not understood by unsaved people. The Bible says the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness to him. Neither can he know them. They're spiritually discerned. Also, a lot of saved people, or at least professing saved people, don't understand either. They don't understand the ways of God. They don't understand the tribulation. And you've heard this uh, when uh, catastrophes happen and terrible things happen. And you say, well, I'm praying for you, or God loves you. And somebody says, if God loves me so much, why would this happen? You've heard that. You've heard that. But the immature believer is about like the unsaved person. They don't understand. They don't comprehend. The Spirit of God has not taught them. All believers are brethren. Whether you like me or not, you're my brother or sister. So better treat me right uh, we're brothers and sisters in Christ God is our father this is mentioned the fact that we are brethren is mentioned 17 times in this little book of James and he was writing to his persecuted and his dispersed brethren and the context of his writing is temptations trials tests tribulation is one of the tests of faith. Jesus spoke of trials in, uh, in the Gospel of Luke chapter, uh, and you don't need to turn there, but for, for time's sake, I'll, I'll read it. Jesus talked about trials. He said in verse 22 of Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 22, that truly and truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. The Son of Man uh, was tested, he was tried. Then verse 28, ye, ye are they which have 
continued with me in my temptations. In my temptations. Then over in, uh, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 18, Paul spoke of trials. He said, when they were come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia after what manner I've been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable to you, but have showed you, have taught you publicly, and from house to house. And then Peter also had some trials and tribulations. He said, I'm undergoing heaviness through manifold temptations, or many temptations. Back in our text, in verse 2, the believer's trials are to be divers, and that word means various. All kinds of different temptations. And uh, then manifold is many. So if there come unto you, or I'm sorry, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Many temptations. But, but, James said that the true believer can accept adversity knowing that God is in control. God's got this. Savannah made that statement famous. God's got this. Count it all joy, he said. God has a purpose. So how many times have you, when your world was falling apart, have you looked up toward heaven and say, Lord, I thank you for all this trouble. Anybody here ever done that? Thank you that you've, that it's rained on my parade today. No, we don't do that. We don't do that. But uh, the trying of our faith produces patience. Uh, Patience is the source of being perfect and entire, which we see in verse 4, I guess it is. Yeah, let patience have her perfect work, that she may be perfect and entire or complete, wanting or lacking nothing. Each is a part of the purpose for trials. I can't remember who said this. I've tried to think who said this. I read this quote by some famous Christian at, at some point who said, I have yet to see a man greatly used of God whose heart has not been crushed. Does that ring a bell with anybody? I've read that quote. Just can't think who said it. But I believe there's, there's something to that. Now, pain and sorrow are not, not good in themselves. Hebrews 12, 11 says, Now no chastening, for the present seems to be joyous, but it's grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto, righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Christians are not living for the present. He is preparing us for heaven. He's trying to get us ready to go to heaven. You see, it's going to be an abrupt change from this life to that life. We better be preparing. Let him prepare us. Let him, let him uh, temper us and make us what we need to be. Otherwise, it's going to be a real shock when we get there. Uh, Romans 8.28 says, All things, not some things, all things work together for good. And to further translation, all things are working, are working together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Not all things are good. I've told you this before. I love wilted lettuce with vinegar and sugar and 
lettuce, and bacon grease. You like that? I love it. I love it. I don't particularly like to drink vinegar by itself. Sugar's not real tasty. I like it in Hershey bars. <laughs> but bacon grease, no, keep it away from me. None of it's good in itself, but you mix all that up together. And you pour that bacon grease over that lettuce and mix the vinegar in and sugar and all that, and it's so, so, so tasty. If you've never tried it, you ought to. It's good. Uh, God designs trials to prove the genuineness of one's faith. There are no accidents. The word trying comes from the Greek word dokomion. Not that that means anything to you, but uh, that's where it comes from. Uh, just to step back, take one step back. I thought about this. You see, Eddie Thomas's surgery is scheduled for Monday. If his surgery had been Monday, I wouldn't have talked to him. But it was delayed. And they were somewhat concerned about that. They were a little bit upset that they didn't get to have the surgery. But after yesterday, after it was all over, everybody was saying, boy, God knew what he was doing. God worked that. All things work together for good. To them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, God worked it out. And I believe that. I firmly believe that. That God directs every step that we take. Uh, this word trying or testing uh, had to do with uh, testing of metals to prove the genuineness of the of the of the of the metal. Fire, it was fire was applied. Fire purifies what it can can't consume, and it consumes what it can't purify. Remember that. So when your life, when things in your life are being tested. It's not to prove that you aren't really saved or that you aren't really what you, what you profess to be. It's not trying to prove you're not. It's trying to show you that you are. If you pass the test and God throws you into a fiery furnace and he tests you, puts you through the fire, he's not trying to show you that you're not real. He's trying to show you that you are. I'm sorry? He's trying to shape you. That's exactly right. Uh, some of us are very, we, we rebel against that type of thing, don't we? We don't like that. We don't like to be shaped. We're satisfied right the way we are. and We don't want to be, we don't want to be messed with. Well, that's the way we are. That's the way we are. Uh, there was Job. Remember Job when, Satan accused him of having a phony faith. Satan said, the only reason you serve God is because he's been so good to you. Job said, it's not so. So Satan and God got together and they worked out a plan where, whereby Job got a chance to prove who he said he was. God's objective was to prove that Job's faith was real. And uh, in Job 13 and verse 15, Job said, Though he slay me, well, yet will I trust him. But I will maintain my own ways before him. I hope I, I hope I will be like Job. When trials come and tribulations come, I hope, it all, I hope I can always say, I know whom I've believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. We don't have any right to question God's 
methods in producing the desired fruit. He knows the bitter agonies of sorrow and suffering are needed to conquer our sin and our selfishness. It was through the suffering and the shame of God's Son that the sin problem was dealt with at Calvary. Genuine faith comes to the forefront, rises to the top, just like cream rises to the top. Real faith rises to the top when it's tested. I would like to be able to say, and I hope you'll be able to say, even though I don't understand, I can't see your purpose, God, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. Can you do that? Well, it's easy to sit here in this auditorium with brothers and sisters and say, oh, yes, I can. But how about when we're tested, really tested, can we still say that? Why are there such different reactions when trouble comes? Faith in God, sincere, honest to goodness, faith in God. See, God's goal for the believer is completeness. He's trying to make us complete and ready for heaven. I want to be ready. I don't want to go there unprepared. I'm not talking about missing heaven. But there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ one day. And we're going to stand before him in judgment for what we've done or not done since we've been a Christian. So trials accepted in the right sense produces Christian maturity. Then finally, it's time to wrap up, but I want, I want to finish this. Patience versus long-suffering. Verse 4 says, Let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire or complete, wanting or lacking nothing. Long-suffering has to do with patience with people. And that's produced by the Holy Spirit. Long-suffering, or patience rather, in circumstances is produced by living through adversity. Patience in circumstances is produced by living through adversity. Then perfect work that has to do with the maturity of the believer have you reached full growth yet? Well, I've got to confess to you, I haven't. He's still working on me. He's still working on me. God can use adversity to bring us to full growth. The believer's prayer is not should not be for deliverance from trials, but to express confidence in the trials. See me through them. Divine love often sends trouble to the child of God. You believe that? God's divine love lets trouble come into your life at times. The difference is how we respond to trials. How do we respond? There's the question of actions versus reactions. You see, actions are planned Reaction is response to crisis. What happens when something unexpected hits you right between the eyes? What's the reaction? Is it godly or is it ungodly? The patience that James would have us to cultivate is an intensely active energy, not just a passive endurance. It takes active energy to endure passively. I think I've told you this too about the time I went to the eye doctor in Beckley and I was seeing northern lights and everything flashing in the corner of my eye and 
two, two doctors in Princeton area had missed it. They said they couldn't find any problem, but they sent me to Brett the Consultants. And that doctor looked at me for about two minutes and he said, hmm, you got a torn retina. I can't let you leave. He said, it's bleeding right now. He said, I'm gonna do laser surgery. He took me across the hall, set me down in the chair and a few minutes he came into the room, had a big needle. I mean, it was big needle. He said, I'm gonna put this in your eye. He said, to relax. <laughs> relax and sit real still while I put this needle in your eyeball. That took more than a passive endurance, let me tell you. That took an active consciousness of what was about to happen. <laughs> but he did it, and I guess I did okay. But uh, he fixed me. Uh, but it takes energy to uh, it takes energy to endure passively sometimes. James' thoughts on patience and perseverance are found in verse four: "Let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing." It's kind of like the uh, patience. Patience is kind of like a ship that's securely anchored in a storm, safely, securely anchored. That's patience. Perseverance has to do with a ship with its sail set, an eye on the compass, and a firm hand steering the ship with a definite destination in mind. Let me ask you as we close. Do you have a complete confidence that Jesus Christ is the captain of your ship and that he'll guide you through this life and beyond? Do you have that absolute assurance? If you don't, see me after service. Or see Brother J.W. Or see some of these men here. I trust that you have that confidence, that absolute, total assurance that Jesus Christ is the captain of your ship. Let's bow for prayer. Let's stand.